Um, cool. So I'm thinking we we dive in. I got a couple topics here that weren't on the agenda. We were a little white on the questions, like everyone had, uh, like Megan had mentioned earlier. I'm gonna close the chat. Angelica, you can handle the new uh, new people coming in, so I can close this too. So I'm trying to figure out where to start. Um, I was talking with Catano. So Catano and I are going to do a podcast. Maybe he'll come back. He's in uh, he's in Mexico right now, uh, enjoying some margaritas and staying on the beach. So kudos to him. I hope he enjoys it. He should get a little time to relax. And so what we were talking about, him and I, we were just like, we were just brainstorming here because it's a question that I get a lot from both our customers and from the market. And I was I wanted his advice before I went and answered this. And, uh, and we talked about it and I <laughs> brought it up and he was like, I get this question all the time and I'm not really sure how to answer it. And so we, we brainstormed and we're going to do a larger podcast on it, but I'll just kind of talk through, which is that if you adjust your demand marketing metrics away from channel attribution, MQLs, then how do you score an individual marketer, an individual contributor on the team, right? So if like the person's doing SEO, if they're running paid search, if they're creating content, if they're doing creative, like how do you measure the success of that position knowing that, and the way that I've been looking at this a lot is, it is the, the sum is greater than the parts. It's the whole system working together. It's not one channel versus another. You actually need the whole mix. You need all of it. And so um, we were brainstorming my, my gut. And like I said, I don't feel strongly about this yet. I'm more posing this. Maybe we'll get some questions. Maybe as I talk through it, we'll get more data and then I'll, I'll have my position clear. But at the top level, your marketing team overall, whether that is a four person team or a 60 person marketing team is getting scored on marketing source revenue, marketing source qualified pipeline. And then at the, at the bottom layer, marketing source demo requests through a website sales conversion. Okay. And all this, all the stuff created off that. But what happens before that? Like how does one single person contribute? And so I've thrown out some ideas. On SEO, I think it's actually quite simple. There's two ways that Katano and I came to. And so number one is whoever is the demand leader or whoever's the SEO expert or whoever's in the company can decide what are the priority keywords and then and then choose based on rankings how you can move the needle on those rankings. If you sell a, a sales engagement platform, and the, the term sales engagement platform, you're ranking number eight, incentivizing that marketer to get you to number three is a good, good idea, right? And so you could pick a top set of keywords, high buying intent keywords, ideally that you're spending a lot of money on Google ads already and try and move those up. And that's how you would score an individual marketer. I look at it, which is if they're focused on a specific channel, score them based on the goals of that channel, the goals and or deliverables of the channel that contributes to the whole system. And so SEO, you could focus on rankings. If you were, and for like high intent terms, you could focus on the rankings. For long tail terms, um, Gatano was talking, this is sort of outside of my um, place where I like to specialize, but on long tail, he was focusing on that as being the entry point in Google Analytics to the conversion, right? So do they land on that long tail page and then convert would be the second way um, to look at that because a lot of people write long tail keyword blogs that are not relevant to their product and drive irrelevant traffic and do nothing. And so it's sort of a way to avoid that, that system. On paid search, I came up with this one and whether you're using an internal marketer or an agency, this would be a great way to measure someone if they're just focused on paid search, is to look later funnel and then work backwards. But the primary metric becomes later funnel, which then incentivizes them to look later as opposed to right now, it's just CPA conversions. And so if you looked at sourced SQOs and cost per SQO is the leading metric, and then you worked backwards into demo and cost per demo, which would be a secondary metric, I think is a good idea. Now where it starts to get a little bit fluffy is on support functions like creative that fuels paid social or content that fuels organic LinkedIn or those types of things, right? Because in or if you wanted to use them in measurement, you would actually do them the wrong way typically. And so at that point, I think we're looking at a combination of um, channel level engagement and just the sole deliverables and subjective quality of the deliverables is the best that I've come up with right now. And so if you are, you have a content team and you need in order to fuel your hundred thousand dollars a month in LinkedIn ads, you need um, seven pictures 
and two videos and three carousel ads and one story format if LinkedIn ever launches their story format as I get onto that. If you need all those things, did they deliver it or did they not? That's binary. And then how well did it perform relative to, to last month or, or however you look for it? I think that's, a, that's where I look from an individual team level, especially on content, it's the, con the contribution on social. But overall, the team is aligned on trying to get to the overall outcome, which is marketing source revenue. Um, so I'll pause there, see if anyone has any, any thoughts on that. I would um, be interested in questions, uh, debates, because this is not a, not a fully formed opinion of mine yet, or I can keep going. Well, we'll see if someone chimes in with questions, but I think the, I loved what you said about the team high level goal and high level metrics. I think what's really key is if you get too granular and specific, even within an ind individual department um, on what an individual's goals are, you were alluding to this a little bit. Sometimes, you know, if things go wrong, they can over optimize for something at the expense of the greater good or what the ideal output is. And so I think a great way to really bring any individual department together, but also multiple departments together is to create a shared goal or outcome that you're working towards. So mm -hmm. I think with a lot of this stuff, even if you're, if you go back to like marketing and sales alignment or, or things like that, every opportunity where you're able to connect different people, different teams, different departments back to, back to one goal, um, even if their individual contribution isn't, you know, explicitly measured to a numeric KPI, uh -huh. um, I think that can create the outcome that, you're, that you want to. So I think that's really, really key in this process. And I think it's important for everyone to have goals and for people to be measured and get feedback, but you want to be careful and not, not go overboard there too. Uh -huh. I think we had one question come in here. Otherwise we can talk about the next one, which I'm excited yeah. about. Looks like um, David K. you want to come on the line? So, okay, I like what you're saying, but I'm wondering, is it any different than what we have today, right? So you need to, as you've kind of put before us the question, how do you measure the individual contributions of different channels and different mediums? And, and what I, I love about so much of your writing over the last year, I guess it's been how Thank long you. have we known each other, um, is you're saying, can you link it to revenue? link it to revenue. Don't worry about just counting all the in-between steps. Show it all the way to the revenue side of things, which I think is a, is a, a clarion call that a lot of people are, are saying, that makes sense. We like this. You can see it in the feedback on your comments. But, and, and so that's good. I'm not suggesting that's not good. But what you just described seemed to be basically doing what we're doing today, all the different kind of particle it's, um, measures of our different mediums and, you know, how many, how many, um, have we improved our SEO? Are we increasing web traffic? Mm -hmm. Is the, is the um, PPC functional? Not just, you're suggesting, don't just measure the conversion at the beginning, but push it further out. How many of those conversions are turning into opportunity so that you have better conversions, not just, excuse my term, bullshit conversions, mm -hmm. right? Um, isn't that what, so, did I miss something? Um, I think it's, an, it's a good clarification point the challenge with how a lot of marketers are scored today based on their individual channel is they optimize the channel and don't create the actual outcome, right? And so people that run LinkedIn that get measured on attributable leads in LinkedIn, run content download on LinkedIn and try and optimize for the lowest CPA regardless of whether or not they move anywhere. And so in order to break, if you, the first part of the statement was, if you agree that you need to break away from channel attribution because it causes the wrong behavior, the wrong optimizations inside of individual channels, because that person needs to demonstrate that they're doing something correctly or that they're proving they're, they're justifying, you know, their job or things like that, then you, you don't have a clear path to revenue, at least on LinkedIn, right? Like if you're going to use LinkedIn the right way, we do measure like view through and click through conversions. Um, but if you look at a team of what's contributed on LinkedIn, there's media, there's creative, there's content, there's the, the person that's orchestrating all of that. There's a lot of people. So how do you measure one person that feeds just that individual system um, is, one, is one thing that I was thinking about. On the, on the ranking side, I don't think it's too much different. The challenge is that in a lot of marketing teams, you'll see 
they get scored on the amount of keywords that they have in the top three. And then they pick a lot of low competitive or like low competition, irrelevant long tail terms that create traffic that don't actually do anything. And so it's just, it's trying to avoid those types of things. Okay. So if I was a, a, a VP of marketing and I had a team and they all had their pieces and I had my piece too, um, what I'm taking away from this a little bit and, and catch me if I'm wrong, cause I'm trying to test the assumption that I've yeah, understood love it. is um, keep all those measures that we have in place now, but now I want to add some other measures that show that what each of our tactics and mediums are doing is, is making it into an opportunity and that the value of the opportunity and the conversions on the opportunities are closing, right? So that I um, shine a light on quality, not just quantity, if you will. Mm -hmm. And perhaps there's going to be somewhat of a self-correcting process because I'm going to bonus people based on how, how many things get to a pipeline and close as opposed to how many things become top of funnel. I'm, I'm going to measure how much of it makes it to the bottom of the funnel because that's a sign of quality. And then over time, trying to figure out what amount of my, of each person's job needs to be focused on the top versus the bottom. Like you've got to have yeah. some amount of quality to make it the way through, but you've got to have some amount of quantity too in the first place. So, Am I yeah, doing so it right? Based on here's, what a, here's a great analogy, right? So the, the CMO VP of marketing, you in this case, is the coach of the football team. The goal is to score a touchdown. But how do you score the left tackle on whether or not they're contributing to that thing? You can only, you can only measure them based on their contribution to the overall goal, right? Did they block the person in front of them? And did that create the outcome that you wanted? And so you have high level marketing goal marketing goals, SQOs, revenue, demos, touchdowns, right? And then you have the content person, the, the wide receiver and the, and the creative person, the running back, and they all need to do specific things in order to make the top level goal happen, which is it's actually separating an individual contributor's role to the outcome because you can't have the, you don't have the attribution tied to it. I'm not sure if that th that came out clearly, but like sure <laughs> you can you can <laughs> still you can still score that if the if you're running the ball to the left hand side and the right tackle doesn't do the jo their job, you can still score the touchdown. Right. So as a team captain, if you will, um, I've got multiple players. Mm -hmm. Some of them are scoring some touchdowns. Some of them aren't, but their contribution is still important. Totally. Um, as a marketing department, I'm I'm responsible for X percent of something, whatever that is, right? I want to mm -hmm. win. Um, and I take some bets on different medias and different ways of, of getting there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, different years, different things do better, right? So this is, this seems, whatever. Yeah. So, so you take cool. a bet, the, the wide receiver runs a Hail Mary. Sometimes you score a touchdown. Sometimes you throw an interception. Right. It's the way that it works, right? And so uh, <laughs> we kind of got lost in the analogy, but but the key is that the, the marketing leader, who I consider the orchestrator, is responsible for, for knowing what components of the system each person is, is supposed to contribute. And then when you detach from a metric like leads, you need to insert something else. And so the thing that I'm proposing that we insert is channel level metrics that should contribute to the goal. It's so just a different way of thinking because everyone right now is trying to attach everything they do to revenue. I knew, I know SEO teams that write long form blogs and then measure the amount of clicks at the bottom of the blog in order to prove that their SEO is doing something right. And like, so everyone is trying very hard to, to on a, if you look at a 30 person team, every person, the person running the LinkedIn ad that wants view through attribution and the Google ad, everyone's trying to get credit for the same thing. And so if you can just get rid of that layer, then everyone can actually, I think has a more flexibility to actually play their part. I'm looking forward to how you continue to write about this over the next couple of weeks. Can't, can't wait. I appreciate <laughs> you challenging me with a couple of questions. It just helps me think through it. I really do appreciate it. Cool. Good to see you, David. What we got Megan, otherwise I'll keep, keep talking uh, about the next one. We got one good question submitted in advance. Do you want to jump to that and then we can get back to the agenda? Yeah, and, sounds and, great. Uh, Call out to the to the crew. Throw throw your questions in. We don't have too many that were submitted in advance, so we can bring you on the air. 
to ask your question to, to Chris. Um, so we have a fun anonymous question that was submitted. Wow. I don't know who it was, so uh, I will have to set the stage here. Um, but I think uh, it's, a, it's a good scenario that, that seems really real. So they want your advice on, on what you would do if you were in their shoes. So they're working for a startup. There's no senior marketing leadership. The company has never had a CMO. There's no real clear structure or strategy beyond the mandate of lead generation. Um, the current lead gen efforts are focused on content syndication with a minimal budget, uh, with the main priority uh, of getting leads. Um, this individual um, coming into the organization has made some suggestions. They've suggested starting a podcast, increasing the content output, um, putting on more webinars, um, all in an effort to try and get more inbound going. But they say it's been an uphill battle, um, even implementing sort of the most simple content marketing strategies. So they're sort of setting the stage and they'd want to know if you were in their shoes, what would you do? So besides, besides this is find another company to work for. <laughs> the, this is the perfectly described marketing death wish. There are marketing manager level, even sometimes director level marketing employees that are the single marketer that are in a startup, which is probably less than 20 people, maybe, th maybe less than 30 people with one marketer that's in this exact position. Right. And so the only answer here is go somewhere, is find somewhere else to work. Like there's no, this is a, having been through this once, there's just no, there's no solution. It all roads end to you leaving. The question is whether you wait a year and struggle or if you just do it now. And so my, I mean, I wish I could give like a better clear answer. I wish that I could provide some wisdom that would completely change this organization's thinking. Um, but that's, uh, highly unlikely. And so um, I would not swim upstream until you drown. I would just get on the raft and go somewhere else. My analogy is a bit odd point tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I understand why it was an anonymous question. So I don't think I, I wish there was more to say, but I don't think that there is. Well, um, one thing maybe that I could offer while you're looking for your next job to leave the company, <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing that you can consider is um, it sounds like there's no leader. It sounds like there's no one asserting themselves to sort of to set to set the tone. And so when I've been in situations in my career where um, there ha there's been an absence of leadership, and this may or may not work, but if you know if you're going to take Chris's advice and and find your next company. Um, you know, on your way out, you could make an attempt to have a positive impact. So if you were the CMO, if you were the head of marketing, um, how would you cast a vision and, and create a plan, right? Um, taking initiative to say, you know, if this is what I think we should do. This is, you know, I, it's clear this person has made a lot of suggestions and it hasn't gone anywhere. But putting together or using this as an opportunity to think through a more strategic marketing plan and, and present it. And if it if it falls on deaf ears and goes nowhere, it's a it's a great exercise to go through to take with you to your next to your next place, and at least you've really made every every effort that you can and and validate that that your advice is probably right. Yeah, you're <laughs> so, on you're on point tonight. I like it. Cool. The next thing that I've been getting a lot of questions about recently, um, and again, not not fully formed, but we'll just kind of like I someone literally asked me this this morning. And so I want to like share because as we keep going on, like it's actually um, that things change quickly. Right. And so um, the next thing that some that people are asking me for is so, okay, Chris, we, we have completely adopted your idea where demo requests and the pipeline and revenue created off of that or whatever your website can website sourced high intent leads that generate pipeline and revenue we buy into that and now we're doing some of the stuff and how do we what are things that are before that what are the leading indicators before that that so that we know whether or not um our demos are going to go down next month or not or whether they're going to go up. Like what, what can we look at before the demo request to have more predictability? 
everyone wants a system where they just like put a coin in and then two coins come out. And unfortunately it's not that simple. Um, Google for some cases will be, um, but in like complex B2B doesn't really work like that. So anyway, I put together a set of metrics that I think would be, if there was like a dashboard for it, I think this would be a good thing to look at, which would pull data in from a couple different sources. So the first thing that you're going to look at is you're going to look at the indicators before the demo conversion. And so the things that I would look at is non-paid home page traffic. Is it going up or is it going down? If you're doing advertising on Facebook, then, and you're hitting the right people and people are aware and you're doing other things in the system, you should have more homepage traffic or if it's SEO or a lot of different things. So homepage traffic would be one. Demo page views trending is a great metric to look at. And then conversion rate on that page trending. And Kyle Lacey has a CRO squad that I would highly recommend if, if this flow starts to become really important. If you have a lot of volume that you figure out how to move that by one percentage point because downstream, it makes a huge difference. Um, and so that's from a website analytics. Those are the things that I would initially look at. And then if you have unique business things, like you're going, you also have a pricing request page and you want to also look in half the demos come through that. You're going to also want to look at that. Um, and then if you're in, in the media platforms, oddly enough, like um, particularly on Facebook, we've, seen a pretty strong correlation between impressions and demo requests. Um, and so if you're targeting the right people as, as like, as much as I don't want to believe this data piece, like we've, we're seeing it right now that impressions are correlated with more demo requests when ad prices went up during the election and we spent the same amount of money, impressions went down significantly and sometimes demos did too. And so that that was an interesting correlation. You should run that model for yourself because I don't know whether that was a, a you know a couple different instances or whether that's right for you or whether it's only specific to Facebook. I do not believe that it to be true on display, but that is an assumption. Um, and so I would look at impressions. You can look at CPM as CPMs go up, impressions are going to go down, or you're going to have to spend more in order to cover your impressions. Um, and then I would look at engagement off of the ads. And so you can look at paid scroll depth. One of the things that people have been trying to do, which I, I uh, have tried to address because it's a, it's a common thing that people would think, which is that, okay, we want to set it, We want to know what the, the blanket conversion rate is on our website. And then all we have to do is add more traffic. And so what they'll do is they'll say, okay, our website right now is we have 20,000. Let's just make it easy round numbers. We have 10,000 people coming to our website right now, and we're getting a hundred demo requests. So what is that? 1%, I think. Yeah, it's 1%. So we're getting 1% of all the traffic is converting to a demo request. And so now all we need to do is drive more traffic. And then what we're going to do is we're going to spend a lot of money on paid social and the website, tra the website traffic is going to go from 10,000 to 100,000 and the conversion rate's going to go down and they're wondering why. And it's like, this is paid social mobile traffic we're, that we're not trying to convert right away and you sell a six, you know, 60 day sales cycle product. Like it's just not going to work like that. And so I've looked at homepage traffic and organic homepage traffic instead, because I think that's more of a normalizer. Um, because if only it was that easy to just have that conversion rate and then just drive a ton of paid traffic to a case study and then just keep a 1% conversion rate marketing would be a lot easier, but unfortunately it's, it doesn't work like that. And so those are a couple of the indicators that I would look at. And then lastly, I would look at um, demo request trends for the month on a daily basis for this month compared to the goal compared to last month and put that on a chart together. And you can see how you're tracking day by day against previous month and goal. Um, the previous month one is really interesting. You start to see trends, like for whatever reason, CFOs love to get demo, submit demo requests on Fridays. It's fa it's fascinating, but for whatever reason, we get the most demo requests on every Friday. And so we use that information that we spend more media on Fridays because we see it every week. Um, Austin has a good question. Should we... Austin, it's going to be tough to top your last one, but let's try. Yeah. All right, you want me to come on? Yeah, <clears throat> you're in. All right. So 
uh, been listening to a lot of previous episodes and, and talk to me a little bit about B2B Facebook because I was on one of them where you're talking to somebody about a hospital board, right? They were selling to hospital boards and you go, yeah, we sold to hospital boards, but instead of running ads at the board, we ran Facebook ads to the respiratory therapist, which created demand underneath and that drove the purchase. And so kind of creating this it's not a it's not a demand cascade because it doesn't cascade up, but whatever. Work work with the analogy. My analogy is not as good as yours tonight. <laughs> so a little bit with with that is so so the creative execution on that is utility and education based on feedback. I assume with talking with respiratory therapists around your subject matter, right? Yeah, we can we can, let's go through the whole example. I think it's sure. really interesting. So, <clears throat> um, not necessarily boards, but medical directors which are several layers below the actual person, which is the exact same thing in every B2B sale, right? Like a FP&A manager can definitely influence the purchase of a software and influence the CFO to come inbound and buy it. Definitely happens. And so this is in every, I interact with a lot of companies that will only target C-suite, which I think is so short-sighted given all the other people, if they're educated, that can influence that decision, right? And so how do we get there? I I went to, I would say probably close to a hundred sales calls with field sales reps. And I listened to how they pitched the product and what they were talking about. And then I said some things and then I listened to how they, the person responded and what questions they asked and what objections they had. And, um, and you could, you can feel based on their reaction, what, whether they're interested or they're pushing back or different things like that, you can get a feel for it when you're in person. Um, and so I used all that data and then I started to find trends. And one of the trends, for instance, was like, they don't understand that there are less side effects with our product in this patient population or whatever. We're starting to get like medical, but they don't understand this specific point, even though there's a massive clinical trial that shows that this, that their belief is not no longer true, that it actually, this product has less side effects. And so our, my job was to figure out how to get everyone that information because I knew if they had that information, they would be more likely to purchase the product. It's just, it's black and white at that point. Like the, that person's job is to make the best decision for their patient. And this data is saying that the thing that they're using right now is not the best decision. Ours is. And so it's just like an, any B2B situation can be simplified to just that. Right. Right now you're doing budgeting and forecasting in Excel. You have a huge team working on it. You risk over hiring people because you're doing it in Excel and there are errors and you might mess up, but we have this thing and all you need to do is install it and model your Excel and everything is going to go much smoother and you don't have that risk anymore. And so how do you teach someone that in a way so that they understand that there's a better way to do something is, is basically all it comes down to and not being in, not being invested in whether or not they decide right now. And so if you can remove the intent of converting them right now, you can truly just give them the information in an objective way and let them decide. I think one of the, one of the superpowers that I have as a marketer is I try to, is I, I try, I think I've, in a lot of cases I am objective in the information. I tell customers that they're not a good fit for us. I tell them that we, you know, we won't be able to do that or that, you know, that, that goal is unrealistic or in, in some cases for the medical company, like we, if we put out a study, we would also say, and by the way, this to be balanced, this study was also published showing X, Y, and Z that we're not in our benefit. And so, and you get so, you create so much credibility when you give people the full story, when you just tell them the truth. And if you have a good product and it's positioned the right way, and you have the data to support that it's going to be a good decision for them, then you let them decide. Um, and so I've, I've taken that approach for a long time and just find that it, the only variable in that is, can you communicate effectively and is the product actually good? And if you can, you can really simplify it to that. And so when you think about specifically B2B Facebook ads, it is a communication channel. It went one with massive scale, depending on who you're going after, right? And so all I think, it's, it's, I'm glad we got here because it's how to think about content and distribution here on, on the agenda. And so um, a lot people spend 90% of their time or maybe 99% of their time creating the content and no thought to whether or not someone is actually going to consume it. And so what I've figured out over time 
is that it's you need to have good content and it needs to be packaged and distributed in a way that someone actually consumes the message. And that is um, like, it feels really simple, but it is, right? Like, um, and so we run, we have people that run like SEO blog and Facebook ads that is a 15 minute read. And I know that those are, if you look in Google, Google Analytics, no one's getting through it. They're skimming it and leaving because it's too long. And so if you're able to adjust to the channel and know that, okay, this is going to go out on a mobile device. Someone's on the train. They didn't expect to see this. They don't have intent to find the answer to this because they're not in search. I'm going to have to package this in a way that they can get the message quickly versus SEO where someone is, is searching for it, looking for an answer and looking for potentially depth. Um, and so happy to answer a follow up there, there, but this one I feel very, um, very good about. Yeah, it was a really good answer. So my follow up on that is that, so more along the lines of the distribution, um, let's see, it was in here. It's moved with all the comments, a lot of good comments, um, was about, all right, so you're going after respiratory therapists. Are you, when you're creating, when you're actually running the campaign, are you loading up a preloaded audience, a custom audience of respiratory therapists that you know, hey, we pulled this data from Zoom or wherever and, uh, and loading it in there, doing lookalike audiences, are you going or cold targeting just in the tool, all three? This is a process of testing. And so in, um, at the beginning, I'll t talk you through the whole thing. Respiratory therapists is a very easy thing to title, to target in Facebook. I don't need a tool like Clearbit or Metadata. I can just say respiratory therapist job title, field of study, respiratory therapy, interest, um, uh, American Association of Respiratory Care, and it would pop out like 48,000 people in the audience, and I know that there's 54,000 in the US, and so I'm good. And then I just add audience expansion on top of that once I validate the audience. It'll go and find the other people if they use Facebook. It'll also find nurses and other people that are parallel. And so I'll let that algorithm run with pixel data and it'll get better. Now, when we went and we had this massive clinical trial that came out, we did start to use lookalikes and audience expansion to get wider. Cause at that point, like when we launched this clinic, this is 2018, maybe we launched this clinical trial campaign on Facebook. We were spending, I was, I had $50,000 to spend on the campaign and we were getting landing page views on the website for four cents. <laughs> and, and so people like, they're like, is this working? And I'm like, we're getting people that are in the audience, respiratory therapists, emergency medicine physicians, all these people on our website, reading the clinical trial that basically proves that our product is better for four cents. And so um, I think the targeting depends on the, how narrow your audience is and how wide you think the campaign could go. When that trial, trial, trial was published, even p patients at home that were on the product could know about that and then either request to go on the product or other things like that. And we had people, we had an inbound come in, like the third day we were running this campaign, it was an emergency medicine physician. And they said, hey, I just had a patient come in that has to be put on your product. Can I like see it? And so like that's the benefit of lookalikes is that it is, or audience expansion, either one that you choose is pure scale knowing that you will run inefficiently. The questions oh. are rolling in. Should Great. We, should we go to the next one or of course. Do you have a follow up Austin? Did I cut you off? You good? Two great questions, two weeks in a row. I like it. Uh, and Max has another Facebook question. So why don't you come on and, and talk through yours, Max? Good to have you back on. What's going on, guys? Thank you. What's up, homie? Good to see you. You too. Um, so yeah, kind of sticking in the same uh, thing that Austin was going along. So how do you set up your like campaigns versus ad sets and ads like structure wise? Because um, like for just for in my case, just so it's easy, like I'm doing B2C ads on one side of the business and like you just run like sprints campaigns. So, like right now it's holiday season. So holiday campaign ad sets that split up between the audiences and then just the ads within those and you split them out and do all that stuff. But like, if it were like a recurring thing, how would you do that? Because you would want the, um, the ad sets to, once they go past the learning phase, the algorithm gets everything down. Um, it has that. So you can just swap out ads and it performs better, but like just the scale of that, all the ads that are going to be within that, it's just like kind of unmanageable. So curious how you set that up and like how you actually scale it. And also on the B2B side would, yeah, yeah. I'm leveraging it too. 
I don't know whether or not this falls into quote unquote best practices, but this is how I do it and it's been working well. And so, and to a note on best practices, like I get calls from Google ads reps all the time that give us all the wrong advice about how to spend more, how to waste more money on their platform. And Facebook does the same thing. And so like best practices are typically created by the vendor in order to do whatever you want them to do. So that's just a note on best practice. So anyway, this is how I do it. Um, campaign is mapped to the content asset. And so the campaign actually would is usually only one asset, not like some larger multi asset component, right? And so for instance, let's, we'll go through two examples. One, um, you know, Coca-Cola case study. So the, the campaign would be Coca-Cola case study dash objective. Typically our objective is landing page views or custom conversions. And then in the ad sets, the ad sets are broken up by placement and audience. So we'd have stories, metadata, feed, metadata, retargeting, or stories, retargeting, feed, retargeting, stories, lookalike, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And then inside of each of those audiences, the same ads would get copied appropriately to the feed and to the stories. And then once that campaign runs, so basically, and then we have a but typically like six ads for feed at least, and then a couple, at least two for stories. And then we can optimize each individual ad set based on frequency and, and how the audience is responding based on cost per result. And then when that is all done, then you can slowly like ad hits or one single ad has a frequency of 2.3 cost per results going up, turn that off, let the one at 1.6 then have some runway and then turn that one off and then let the one at 1.3 have some runway. It just extends runway of a campaign with a similar audience. Um, and then eventually that campaign will be shut down. And then we have a basically an entire replica that we can then copy. I can, if I'm gonna do another landing page objective one, I can copy the entire structure of the campaign based on the audiences, pull it back up, delete all of the ads, but I have all the audiences, placements, all those different things. And then I just rebuild one set of ads, copy all of it on from one ad set, and then go into the other ad sets and paste all of the ads again, and then wash, rinse, repeat. From if you're doing a high volume of content distribution with like, we're, we're in places where we're spending $150,000 on this channel. And so it's, you know, there's changes going on a lot. So that efficiency and having all the audiences and everything built out. And then if you add another one, you can just copy the campaign and keep building from there. Or you take one out is kind of how we've been doing it. Um, and then like for a product, a product ad, it wouldn't actually be that much different as I think about it. Um, so we, we used to do it based on the entire, um, like we'd have creative come out for a month. And so we would do all creative in one month audience and then like 20 versions, right? Um, highlighting this feature and this integration and this thing all in one campaign. And it just became complicated to figure out, okay, which, which message, which thing does it. And then the last thing is if you're using some of those with like UTM tracking, um, HubSpot's only going to give you it to the campaign level. And so at, at that point we've, like kind of made some changes so that it's very distinctly clear in the campaign. Got it. Okay. Very helpful. And one more question might yeah, be, pl please. Um, very basic. Can you hide campaigns and ads on Facebook? Cause all, all I have is like drafted ones that are completed. And it's just like, they're just sitting there and I can't make them like archived or something. Mm, I don't know I for sure. Everywhere. I just, okay. I just kind of just either let them fall to the bottom or if you really don't want them there, you can delete them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we just have like a string of campaigns and then once it's done, we turn it off and it moves down yeah. and it becomes like, becomes a pretty long thing. We've tried to use like date profiles and other things to sort of be able to, um, to spread them out. And then if you have different regions going, so we have like U S mid market, U S enterprise, like we've, for, depending on the company and the complexity that we will start to add different things like that to keep it more organized. Cool. Thank you. Should we keep the questions going? We let's let's roll. Going. That's why we're here. Yeah. Um, Blake, why don't you come on? Question about podcast distribution. Yeah, uh, no, uh, no, no video today. But uh, my question on like podcast distribution. So this would be for a client that is trying to, you know, get their podcast off the ground. So it'd be organic distribution through their personal profile on LinkedIn. 
but I'm just curious if you guys ever used, um, you know, like a small targeted Facebook audience to distribute the micro clips like you do on LinkedIn and like, you know, fun, you know, work them through 10, 20 clips and see if that's a way to uh, get, you know, listener acquisition through Facebook. Is the, is the goal subscriber acquisition? Yeah. So I've tried this several times to, with no success, um, which is that tip mostly Instagram story swipe ups with either content or just an advertisement to the specific podcast, calling out the decision makers, you know, new nonprofit podcast about this swipe up to subscribe and they swipe up and they would land on Apple and, the one, the first thing is that you can't actually track anything because you don't have the pixel on Apple. So you can't see anything farther than the swipe is one of the challenges. And secondly, it just ha we just haven't seen it be meaningfully successful based on the spend. Like you eventually need to decide, okay, how much am I willing to spend in order to have someone subscribe? And when those numbers are in the hundreds of dollars, then you sort of decide that maybe there's a different way to get it done. Right? Like, um, so that's one kind of like finding is that we have tried it at several different podcasts and several different audiences, not our own, but for customers and have not seen that be a cost effective way to drive subscriptions. The second thing that I would question, which I see a lot is even if you do get the subscription, what's the likelihood of that person getting really deep in? Like, um, I just, I think that you would struggle to get repeat listenership on that through that motion in a way that like makes sense from a cost standpoint. I will provide um, some alternatives, some that we've tried, some that I'm just kind of spitballing on. Okay. Um, so one that would work really well is to get, if you can search whatever the, what's the industry or what is it, what is this podcast about? Uh, this would be aimed at uh, small practice uh, podiatrists. Okay. So that is very, that is very niche. You should try, you, try the Instagram story thing and maybe I'm wrong, but because it's, it's not going to cost you very much to hit that whole audience and see mm -hmm. for yourself, right? So I would give that a shot. Um, know that the creative variation might be the difference between that being successful or not. So I would give it some more variations, but you could figure that out with 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple things. Um, I, would ha I would definitely have the top podiatrist on it. Like I would go and find you. They might be already doing that, but I would definitely do that. That's a very simple one. The next one would be, um, to get on, if there's a top podiatrist podcast blog or top medical blog, see how mm -hmm. you see what you can do to get into that blog. Right. So it, it really helps for listenership to be on the, the if you're, especially in, if you're in a competitive wide category to be on the top 10 nonprofits podcast list for the number one search result in Google, right? Like that's a very good one. And, and you might have to do some things to get on the list, but then it's kind of evergreen. Um, the next one is obviously LinkedIn, LinkedIn organic. Um, I think is a really great one. Email to an existing database for sure. Um, and then where was I going to go with the next one? Oh, I had a really good one, but I forgot it. <laughs> Okay. No, no, those, those, those are super helpful. I appreciate that. I hadn't thought about getting onto the top 10 list one. That was something that hadn't even crossed my mind, but um, oh, that's super helpful. I got it. Yes. And so, and then at, at, in the beginning of the podcast, the keys to success are consistency. Okay. Like um, the reason that we were able to, to be able to take off one is that we had, or we had organic distribution and we had, but, and then after that, it was frequency and consistency of delivery, this event here, and just overall volume, right? Like when you're producing three podcasts a week versus another marketing podcast, that's producing one a month, that's four months delayed because they record it and then it takes them four months to publish it. And by the time they publish it, it's irrelevant that, that you create like a, a lot more listenership because a lot of people are looking for something and the one that actually has good fresh content that that's how you win. Right. So at the beginning I would focus a lot more on the cadence and the quality getting better. Quality is not the audio quality, right? Like I still have this $300 mic here. You don't need super high. And we do raw zooms that get like, you know, glitches and things like that. The audio quality is not the issue. It's about having quality information 
and, and delivered in a consistent fashion. And once you figure that out, then the next frontier is sort of like on district. You can do distribution in parallel, but walking that kind of like flow in first, I think is really important. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks, Chris. Pre- appreciate that. Super helpful. Yeah. And if it's small, like niche market, like I would, I would have those people on the podcast and like email can, could work. Um, would love you to take me up on the event strategy once some once we can do events again, which is unclear when that will happen, but the micro event plus industry thought leader recorded and filmed with 20 people with a Q and a is a really strong play. Well, we got the uh, vaccines coming out here soon. So hopefully that can roll out sooner as opposed to later. And I'll hopefully yeah. I can report back something on that. We're staying optimistic. Let me know what you find. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Blake. Well, you mentioned Gatano. We have an SEO question. Okay. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> can tackle it. Uh, it's funny because I, like, I, um, I actually know SEO quite a bit. I like gr- I grew an e-commerce company and was ranking first for like very competitive terms in 2013. And so like I sort of downplay my, my SEO skills, but I, I got some stuff over here. <laughs> um, I think, I think you'll be able to answer this one. Um, Abhishek, do you want to come on? Hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Do you want to come on and a- ask your SEO question? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Megan. Um, so, uh, I've, Chris, I've, uh, on your LinkedIn post, I've seen you say that SEO is a kind of little, outdated, at least in some context. Um, so for niche application or products that are in niche marketplaces where average search volumes for keywords, let's say is around 10 and not more than 100, is SEO even worth targeting or is it, is it not worth trying that at all and you would go the paid route? How much does the product cost? Uh, so it's, it's a consumable. Mm-hmm. Um, it, let's, so there are two types, let's say, the, so the first type is a consumable piece. It could cost anywhere from a dollar to $5, but it's a per use consumable. And the second product is more durable and that could cost anywhere between thousand to $4,000. Okay. If somebody buys the, the one to $5 one, do they reorder at a high frequency? Yes. And all of this is OEM. We deal with OEMs, B2B. Got it. Okay. And the um, consumable is in healthcare and durable is in and, more analysis. So the next question is, how many people are out there that could reasonably buy this stuff? Is it like 10 accounts or is there a large market? There's just not a lot of search volume. Uh, so there's a large market for the consumable piece. It's that the um, buying power is kind of concentrated because let's say there are maybe 50 companies that would make use of this for the consumable piece and the durables. It's a lot more um, discreet buying, buying powers here and there and depends mm-hmm. a lot based on geography. So that is more in the thousands range. Yeah. And so, and, and so you, you are selling this to a company that puts that puts it in as a component into their product and then sells it to an end user. Yes. Okay, perfect. So so somebody else had a question like this last week. And I really I like thought about it because I was thinking I was like, I didn't clearly explain it. I have the the clear explanation. When it it is it is much different to to sell a product to an end user versus an OEM. It is it is a very different sale. It's like if it's as if you were selling a let's just consider the consumable is a razor blade. And you need to, you can either sell it to the end user or you can sell it, you can try and get Walmart to put it on their shelves. And the, the two between selling those is a completely different go-to-market motion, right? Yep. And so um, a lot of the stuff that we talk about here is, is truly focused on selling products to end users. And so some of the stuff may not be, be relevant to you. I, I believe that there are two core things that you should do in this case, and there, it's not SEO. And to clarify my thoughts on SEO, it's not that SEO is dead. It's not that SEO is ineffective. It's that marketers need to evolve, that there are other places where people are now discovering, researching, and purchasing products and then passing through Google. And Google's getting a lot of credit that it doesn't deserve is basically my thesis on this. So people keep doing SEO 
and not focusing on places where the market is actually moving, where there's a lot more upside. Mm -hmm. Now, the two things that I recommend for you, number one is you should, if there's only 50 accounts, you should start a podcast that surrounds about those accounts and you should interview the decision maker at every one. You should definitely, you should definitely do that. And so the okay. reason is you get market research, you get a, you get a, um, a podcast, you get content. When you go to the third account, you can, are they competitive? Like, are they going to be mad if one, it's a question for you. Are they going to, if you go to Kroger or whoever your customer is, and then if you go three days later to Walmart, is Walmart going to be pissed that you already talked to Kroger? Uh, not for this. And no, I don't think okay. so. Don't yeah. So question. you can go and interview all of those 50 and just yeah. learn and an interesting thing because if you only have 50, your sales reps are probably talking to them too. So you might want to go to some like a job level where your sales team isn't targeting. Cause I just think it, it doesn't feel good as a decision maker to have somebody interview on the podcast and then get a cold sales email from someone different two days later. And so just figure out how to coordinate that. So it doesn't look disingenuous. Yep. Um, so de definitely the podcast. And then the, the second one is highly targeted LinkedIn ads that distribute that distribute information that those people would need to know in order to be ready to buy your product. And then lastly, a sales motion. This is it's lastly it, what? Sorry. The last one is a sales motion. In this type of sale, you are going to need like yes, somebody might come inbound, but there's only fifty accounts, and so there's mar there's a marketing going on. And there's going to be a sales motion overall. I'm not sure I've like done this before for like BEA sensors, right? And like they're selling mm -hmm. to door manufacturers. And in order to get that sale, like you can do marketing, but at some point you're going to want to insert that type of um, sales motion. Oh, and I'll give you one more actually while we're at this. If there's only 50 accounts and you really deeply understand them and you understand why this product has a lot of value, I would create whether it is a um, 30 minute video or like some type of teardown or something where you basically show them all the things that you know about their business mm -hmm. and, and how, you know, what the holes are. So like a company called Profit Well does this. So I can um, maybe Megan or Angelica can link to it. It's called Pricing Teardown. Mm -hmm. And it's a pure play content ABM strategy, right? Like they're trying to get Salesforce as a customer. They're trying to get HubSpot as a customer. What do they do? They go to their pricing page and they talk about all the things that could be better, all the things that could be improved, how it could be more simple, how they could increase their conversion rate. And then they just publish it. They don't even send it to them. The company is going to find it themselves, right? Like somebody's going to forward the content that's, that says your pricing page could use a lot of improvement to the CMO at HubSpot or whoever is responsible for that. Um, and so you could, you could really demonstrate pure expertise on a marketing level. Mm -hmm. of, of what of why they should consider inserting your product versus whatever component they're using right now. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, we, we started doing the uh, a video, like we just generated a video and put it on our website. And now we're thinking of how to distribute it. And it's uh, pretty new to it also. But thanks for that. That was very clearly laid out. Yeah, happy to help some good ideas there. Let me know how it goes. Definitely. It's Bob yeah, time. Oh. Cool, Bob. One second. I just want to close this out. Um, the, the marketing tactics that you need when you are selling, like I, know, I get that in a B2B sale that you are selling to another business, but you are selling to the end user of the product, right? This is a, it is a business to end user sale versus selling to a business that sells to a consumer that sells your product to the consumer. And in that one, it's a B to B to C sale, which is, which requires a very different overall strategy. And I haven't clearly explained that. So I'm really glad we got the question. Cool. Um, Bob had a question that actually, and, and Nuam had something similar. So Bob, you want to come on and set the stage for the next topic? Hello. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. How What's are up, you? Bob? Good to see Pretty you. Pretty good. So I had an interesting call with the CEO today and um, he actually, you know, he's, he's bought in on the whole concept of we have to build out marketing to create demand, not hire more salespeople to, to create the demand, right? So with that, I have a, a potential budget for next year and my questions are kind of number one, who do I hire first? I think maybe the marketing position I'm going to hire is almost a death wish 
that you were talking about before with the caveat that they'd be reporting up to me who at least kind of gets it with a CEO who's putting some budget behind it. So a little bit different. It's and, only, it's only a death wish when it's a junior marketer that doesn't understand how to vet the company and then gets, and junior is a relative term, right? Like doesn't know how to vet the company on how they're going to be measured and then gets jammed into this situation. And so it, it wouldn't necessarily be a death wish because they got you, Bob. Right. But I'm going to, I'm going to partially jam them. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so that, that's kind of the question is number one, where would I start building out that team in order to, in order to position it to be able to scale it. And then the other portion of it is teeing it up. So it was in a position where a company like refine would want to come in and actually even deal with us like right now, or six months ago, you were like hard pass, right? It's just, you guys aren't in a place for us, but with budget and with the right support team in house, what would we be, what, what would we need to be able to do in order to tee that up? It's kind of what I'm looking for. You, I'm looking for the next step. Are you, tr- are you trying to hire us? <laughs> so we're going to have to talk about your, uh, your email response. I sent an email earlier. <laughs> yeah, my inbox is way behind. Sorry. You, you have a uh, hot lead in your inbox. <laughs> so on the team side, you, what's working the best for you? I know that Facebook is happening, but tell me, like, what's happened since last we talked? Have you closed, closed any deals? What else is working? Talk, yeah. Tell me. I mean, so the frustration, obviously, the last couple of weeks, um, you know, the number of contact requests went down, the engagement went down, mm-hmm. uh, have a have a new ad set that's running that's actually doing really well right now. So what's going on right now is I'm creating the content from the resources I have, images and things like that, doing paid social, driving landing page hits, right? The conversion rates are not as high as I want. So I actually, we have an outsourced graphic designer that I asked to create a new landing page for us because we were, I was using what was available on my website as a landing page, which wasn't really geared towards conversions. Mm -hmm. So we have a new landing page that's being designed. And um, so I'm hoping that's going to increase some conversion there. But I'm also at a stage where I'm not even sure if the content that I'm putting out is really the right content per se in terms of, you know, educating, you know, I've just been taking all your advice over time and Mm -hmm. kind of piecemealing it. So I'm kind of looking to hire somebody who really has some level of ability to to take all this stuff off my plate. Cause as you know, it's very time consuming. Whereas I should be focused more on sales activities <laughs> and have someone do this content creation, the podcast, the video editing, like even the video editing clips, I've fallen off with my podcast the last couple of weeks because okay. it's the time to do video editing. So, you know, so I'm looking like, who do I, who do I hire in order to fulfill that content? Do I hire a content creator or a generalist with paid social in order to tee it up so that, it's scalable for a company like you to come in and, and, and put and I guess, distribute the content. I don't, I'm not really sure where to go. Like what would be your next steps? What, what you like to do the least? All of it. Really to, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm actually, I've been enjoying actually kind of creating the content and because mm-hmm. now I'm becoming, I'm like the product expert, right? Cause I'm the salesperson. Yeah. So it's comfortable for me to do that. And I've actually been enjoying that, like dusting off my video editing chops and, and making some, some ad sets and stuff. So I don't mind chipping in there, but I think I really need to, as we get busier, I need to be the one to um, be handling all the, all the sales activities and not spending time doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I asked you those questions in order to kind of slot this in because the the core team sort of always looks the same. Um, Orchestrator, architect, media, distribute, distribution, creative, and, and that sort, and then subject matter expert. Right. And sometimes you can be two of those or, or you're being all four at the same time. Right. And so it's just like, how do you kind of divide those responsibilities up? And that's like the simple team of four. Um, so I consider I'm, I, just based on what you told me, the buckets that you're going to fill is probably the orchestrator architect and the SME product marketer. Right. So those right. are the, those two things. You have a part time graphic designer. So you need to figure out math distribution media. So I would like the most reason, the most easy job title. And it's tough on this one because like there's a lot of people that are doing the same thing that they did in 2006 that use this job title, which is digital marketing manager. Um, but that's probably, that's generally probably the role that you want. You want website, you want CRO, you want a little bit of SEO and you want paid media with a fo- probably a focus on paid social because that's what has been working the best for you right now. I would do paid social web and conversion rate optimization. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cool. 
happy to help Bob. And then also, um, on, in, term, <laughs> in terms of working together, how about we just talk about that offline? <laughs> yeah, no, I was just trying to tee up to that. Legitimately, that's where, that's where we're at. I mean, if I have the right budget at this point, which he threw out a number that really surprised me. By the way, I think he'd be happy in terms of, um, you know, where we're at. I mean, it's a multiple of sales. I, I basically told him, I want a budget for a marketing team to be a multiple of my sales team, not even 50-50. I mean, right now, I want to allocate, I want to hire marketing people and, and ad spends mm -hmm. because I think between myself and my couple other team members, we have the sales bandwidth to take. So we need to build up the marketing. At least that's what I was thinking. Is that totally, okay, this is, this is about, if you think about it at a high level, marketing creates demand and sales captures it. And yep, so if I'm you so have, if you have no existing demand, that is the first place to focus, right? Like we have, if you think, of, I guess, it's tough to quantify in my company because people do multiple roles, but like we have three to four people on the marketing side. And then like right now I do the sales and like if, and so because it's low volume, super high efficiency that you net, you will never need a lot of sales resources ever because we just have a low volume that wins at a very high rate. That is the ICP and we don't need to go outbound. And so I, I personally like, that model a lot. It, I also believe that it scales way better. Um, and so I, I think that we'll see more marketing team, more companies take that approach. It's not going to be a pendulum swing because right now a lot of those companies are at six to one, eight to one, 10 to one sales to marketing. If you look at overall budget and companies that feel like they're doing it very good are three to one sales to marketing. And I think soon you'll see companies that think they're doing it well be two to one marketing to sales. Got it. Agreed. Thank you. We'll see what happens. Thanks, Bob. Nuam, I know you had a similar question. Was that helpful or do you have any follow-ups on this topic before we, we switch gears? Hello. Hello. Hey, hey, great to see you. <laughs> Hi guys. Hey, yeah, hey. I think, um, the way that um, Bob asked that question was very, very similar to me, although I think his position is very different. So um, with mine, I guess, as you know, I've followed you guys since the start of the year. Um, and I've gone from that, that death wish stage to very much now where um, I, I feel like there's a lot of focus on what can marketing do now to basically turn everything around. And I think it's a really great position to be in. I'm pretty excited by so you, it. Hold on. Let's just pause and make sure we clarify. So you were the person that was in the marketing death wish and you persevered at the same company and you're in a much better spot now. Did I hear that yes. right? Let's, let's all <laughs> celebrate. That's great. Woo. Survived. That's awesome. I'm, I'm telling, yeah, this is like one marketing so person. So that's a success story. We should connect the uh, Nuom with the anonymous submission if we can. No, you have to tell us what you did. Yeah, right? yeah. We want to hear this whole, we want to hear the details. Um, basically, so um, I've been listening to you guys all, all year. So I'm really thankful Thank you. to you guys for that. Um, it was very much uh, bringing, bringing in somebody in marketing to just help us look better, have a better brand. And I came in and I did that. I did a, a, a rebrand for the company um, and then was able to, in fact, bring on a, a digital agency on the side as well to help. And I brought on HubSpot as well to try and get all that stuff going. Um, the agency wasn't really good. So unfortunately, that was kind of, um, that hurt my chances a little bit. Um, but I, I've learned a lot from that. Uh, on the other hand, traditional sales company. So build a product, um, hire sales, sales team in every sort of region and then just expect them to, to, to back calculate to average, you know, quota retention times quota times headcount. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, it's now come to the point where, um, the sales team has dwindled down a little bit and obviously the pandemic is, is, you know, to blame for a little bit of that. Changing a lot. Um, yeah. So, and then now it's, well, what, how do we get sales? How do we turn everything around? And um, so I kind of just said, well, it should be led by marketing, you know, and, and our website and everything else. And we've got, <laughs> makes me smile. We've got, we've got three really distinct audiences. 
Um, and so I've, I'm starting to sort of, I've been sort of, I guess, educating all the key players within the business about how we should be doing things and um, how a key um, thing that content plays, you know, the, the, the key role that content plays, especially now that we're pushing to an enterprise model as well. Can you guys see my boy? Um, yes. <laughs> Um, and um, and so now everyone's behind it because the sales thing isn't working, um, and and so I'm thinking now that I've got the opportunity, my CEO has basically said, "What do you need? So who do you need mm -hmm. in your team? What do you need for us to do?" And I'm trying to create this whole plan, and yeah. I want to have a team that is able to do quite a lot of things across, um, you know, new acquisitions and branding mm -hmm. and generating that demand um, but then also supporting across the life cycle of our clients as well and customer experience and that kind of thing because yeah. I think I've said in a previous uh, session that you know we can bring in all these clients but if they don't trade we, we don't we don't make the money either so mm -hmm. it's, it's a full life cycle type of product um, what do you think do you I should do <laughs> I've been arming and arming and I'm thinking I'd love to have someone who's really creative content driven uh, I, I wanted to create a whole sort of content program for each of our key segments and then have someone who's able to actually produce all those things. Um, you know, um, you know, the, the podcast ideas um, help, help us to actually produce those, turn those into different um, uh, content pieces, written and video and all those stuff and help us with our website copy because that's, that's trash at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and then on the other hand, I really need some help with the digital side as well. So analytics and reporting um, mm -hmm. and the website itself. And I'm, I sometimes struggle thinking, can one person do it all? Does that need to be split out? Um, and and who, who does what? Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, um, so let's talk about these couple of considerations, right? Um, do you have anything that's working right now? Last question, because I know you're a little bit distracted. <laughs> <laughs> is, what's working um, the best right now well to be honest um the the stage when we had the most kind of um excitement about the brand was when i started doing a bunch of webinars mm -hmm. and so that was like that education piece and having our brand and we were partnering with um another key supplier in the industry and doing some hot topics and we had hundreds and hundreds of of people coming to those mm -hmm. um but because it was just me i just kind of fell away a little bit yeah um, were you, um, like sponsoring like a third, a third party or co-marketing or doing it on your own? Um, like how did I you get hundreds of people there? Yeah, I did. The first one I did on my own and then I invited two key people, uh, just experts onto the webinar and we had like 300. Did you promote it? Did you send an email? Like how'd you get 300 people there? Oh, so the one of, um, the partnership with one of the people that was came on, they promoted it to their, their networks. And so that got us the numbers, I think. Got it. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, the challenge here is trying to do too much all at once. Like I had a conversation with the CMO of a hundred million dollar company today and there's 35 people on their team. And the exact thing that I said is you don't need to do a lot of stuff in order to make a huge impact. Usually it's only a couple of things that really drive most of the impact. And so um, I was asking you what you think is working the best in order to simplify this so that you have a clear kind of direction and then you kind of know who you, you should hire first. Um, so my, <laughs> my, my feeling on this is that you'll eventually want to own the web. Would you mind putting, your, would you mind putting yourself yeah. on mute? Yeah, yeah, I know you're trying. Um, my suggestion on this would be to own the webinar channel yourself, whether you need an SME internally, whether you already have that person internally and you just need to put it on for them, and then to ideally find a media person in order to get people to the webinars. And so that's, you need an SME and you need a media person. Hopefully the SME is somewhere in your company already. You just need to find them. Or you already know. Then you need someone to be able to get them there, the distributor email ads, different things like that. And then 
the last thing that you could add is a creative and use the media person to run ads on whoever you would target, whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or otherwise that works best for your audience. And that would be like the simple fashion. I would, I, at the beginning, I wouldn't get caught up in the podcast. I, w I wouldn't do a couple of those things. I would keep it simple because the, it feels like the stakes are relatively high right now, right? Like the sales team's shrinking, more pressure is going to be put on marketing. You're not going to have nine months for the podcast to kind of like, you know, actually drive an, uh, a meaningful impact, which is put it that way. Um, and so for those reasons, I would prioritize a couple of the things that have um, tend to when let's talk about it this way. I've never said it on on this um, demand gen live in this way. Basically, the difference is whether it's paid or organic. Right. And so like the podcast is organic. It takes longer. It's like um, it, it crushes long term. It's a bet that you're pay, placing long term. Like the fact that the pod, our podcast is already at this place and already driving an impact is it's just it's not lucky because we executed. But like it's it's different than most. Right. Um, and so what I always recommend is you can pay to get your content in front of people immediately, which then helps accelerate the process to while you, you can build organic. The next piece is whether or not the channel that you're on suits itself better to pay to organic. Right now, unless you're like crushing a Facebook group, there is no reason to post organically on your company page and think that you're gonna get results. Facebook for a company is a paid only channel. LinkedIn, is a is potentially a both channel. I actually recommend doing both. Um, but let's say that you have a you know you are only selling. You're in Belgium, and you're only selling to companies in the U.S. Or you're only selling to come. Let's just make it more simple. We're only selling to companies in Massachusetts. LinkedIn Organic is going to give you things to everyone, but you can go in and use the ads to get very specific about who the, who the stuff's going to show to. So there's different ways to use paid or organic based on what you're doing and what your timeline is and who you're targeting and what channel you're using it on. And so by understanding those nuances, you can start, start to decide which direction should I go and in what order should I do it. Um, and so to get back, I would, I would recommend um, a media person and then figure out the SME and then consider a creative and start keep the system simple while you're going and with those people you should be able to find something that's working and then you follow that trail cool all right perfect thank you great to see you very uh very well done on the holding it together for that <laughs> all right. anything from the agenda that you didn't get to that you want to make sure we cover I'm down to keep getting questions. Is there is there none in there? Everyone's just chit chatting. For that, we uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into what we're talking about in the chat. Okay. <laughs> the listeners can come to Demand Gen Live to find out what goes on here. <laughs> yeah, come here for the chat. Um, I'm sort of I'm sort of good on the agenda. For that, well, um, didn't we want to kind of pull the group? Oh yeah, thank you for reminding me because I would obviously forget. Week. So. Yeah. Everyone, we're going to go to uh, the gallery real quick. So um, next week is sort of like a holiday. And so what we're going to do is poll everyone. So raise your hand if you would attend next Tuesday or if you'd prefer no. So thumb, thumb, let's, let's keep it easy. Thumbs down or thumbs up about whether you want to do one next week. Oh. We got a middle. We got a thumbs up. We got, okay. We're in. I think we're a we, go. We, we listen. We listen to the audience. So yeah, we'll be back here next Tuesday. Um, I love seeing all of you. Hope this was helpful. We got some great questions. Um, would encourage the listeners to please send questions. We opened up an email inbox um, in order to kind of sort. So it's called it's DGL as in Demand Gen Live at RefineLabs.com. DGL at RefineLabs.com. You can submit your questions. And we will answer them on the next show. Hey, Chris, the uh, what was that on Sunday? You had the the straight AMA with with like mm -hmm. no audience. Is it is that submit those questions to that email? We're we're gonna use it as a kind of collection of everything. So okay, um, 
yeah, if it's, it's a valid question, I guess that we haven't thought that far ahead. Um, yeah, just filter those through there. Right, right now they were going to me and I was missing a couple, whether it was in LinkedIn DM or somewhere else. So now we have someone dedicated to looking at that inbox or just keep it more organized. Great question. All right, everyone. Lovely to see you. Hope you have a great week. Um, is it, um, wait, wait, are we doing, is it next Tuesday that we were talking about or the following Tuesday? Well, next Tuesday is, is a couple of days before Christmas. Yeah. Um, and then the week, the next week is a couple of days before New Year's. We, okay. have, we have two holiday okay. weeks, but. Sounds like we're good. We're a go next week. We'll probably be a go the week after. It was good to see everyone. Cool. Great to see you all. Have a great week. Talk, talk to you next week. Bye.